everyone. This is Seth from Radio Wave, and uh, this is the first of a series of videos that uh, I'm making to explain the basics of music royalties. And the reason I wanted to do this is because as a manager of artists and songwriters for many years and a consultant for a lot of artists today, I found that artists and, quite frankly, a lot of music executives don't really understand music royalties, how they work, where the money comes from, um, how to collect the money. And um, it's not to disparage anybody's knowledge, but it's just really to educate people on how royalties work and how artists can get money that they're due. Uh, some of you may know, but others may not. I, I managed artists for a number of years, starting in the 90s. Uh, I initially worked for the manager of Kenny G and George Benson, so I work with those two artists. I managed Brenda Russell for about 12 years. Uh, I managed a couple of rock bands on Epic Records and Capitol Records. Uh, I managed a bunch of independent artists over the years and also consulted for artists like Brian McKnight, Yellow Jackets, uh, and many others. And uh, through the course of my career, I found that you know, music royalties were kind of confusing to people, and uh, especially on the publishing side. And you know, people didn't really understand a lot about where the royalties were coming from, the different sources, and you know what they should be collecting. So this first video talks about the basics of music royalties, and it's going to start with um, royalty categories and definitions. So let's get into it. So there are two major royalty categories for music royalties. There are sound recording royalties and music publishing royalties. Um, sound recording royalties are royalties paid to artists who record songs and the owners of the sound recordings. So typically, traditionally, that would have been record labels. Uh, although today, a lot of artists own their own masters. They act as their own label. So they would then be considered the owners of the sound recordings. Um, the second major category is music publishing royalties. This is the more complex of the two and the one that a lot of people don't understand or just have mix misconceptions about. But music publishing royalties are royalties related to the song itself. So these royalties are paid to songwriters and the companies that publish the songs. Uh, traditionally have been music publishing companies or music publishing administrators. Um, and these royalties are paid to these writers and publishers regardless of what artists record the song or what label releases the song. So the royalties paid on the music publishing side have nothing to do with who recorded the song, who released the song, what labels involved uh, you know, in releasing the song other than that label paying those royalties, which I'll get into later. Okay, sound recording royalties. This one is the category that people seem to understand the best um, because it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and I'm going to focus on the U.S. because that's obviously where I'm based and where I have the most experience. Um, and things are slightly different in other countries, but these concepts are, are pretty similar. Um, so in the U.S., sound recording royalties are referred to in different ways. There are artist royalties. Um, that's royalties payable to artists who recorded the music and you know again traditionally that was record labels you know paying those but there are different ways artists can get paid now uh, in the advent of streaming which we'll get into in a minute um, record royalties uh, same as artist royalties this is an older term that's used in a lot of record contracts still uh, so if you sign with a label they'll refer to the royalties the label pays to you as record royalties in the contract typically um, so that's the kind of situation where you see a contract that says label shall pay the artist 20% of, you know, the gross revenues or the um, retail sales price of a CD or something like that. So those are the artist royalties. They're also called record royalties. Uh, another way that these are referred to is master royalties or master recording royalties. And those are royalties paid to the owner of the master. Um, again, traditionally, that was record labels uh, up until the Internet really changed things. Uh, but today, as you all know, and probably a lot of you 
you know, do this, you own your own masters, you're your own label. Artists can set up a company to be a label. They can just get paid directly as an artist, but regardless, they can own the master recording. Basically, they own those files that the, the music is recorded on. In the old days, it was, you know, two-inch tape. Today, it's, you know, WAV files and stems and all kinds of stuff that are considered the masters. Um, the other type of sound recording royalty are producer royalties, and anybody that has hired a music producer, a lot of times, along with, you know, a fee to produce the music, the producers or their managers will ask for points, and those points are the producer royalties. They're a percentage of the royalties that are due to the artist. Um, that's a little complicated. We'll get into that in another video, but basically, producers can participate in sound recording royalties as well. Okay, the sources for sound recording royalties. Um, the main sources are royalties paid by record labels to artists and producers, which I mentioned previously. Uh, there's also royalties these days paid by digital distributors or aggregators. If you're an independent artist and you're signed up with DistroKid or TuneCore or CD Baby, um, the royalties you receive every month are sound recording royalties. They have nothing to do with who wrote the song. You could have written the song, or you could be doing a cover song, or someone else could have written the song for you, but th those royalties are not what we're talking about. We're talking about the actual royalties from the um, sound recording itself. Uh, sound Exchange, that's, a, that's one that most artists are signed up with. Uh, sound Exchange pays royalties to artists, producers and labels, or anybody else who owns a master recording for music that is uh, played on internet radio stations, Sirius XM, uh, platforms like Pandora. So anything that's not your traditional AM FM station that has a tower and a, you know, an actual office somewhere like a brick and mortar building. Uh, so any, any radio quote unquote, that's, um, just internet only or satellite radio sound exchange collects royalties from the airplay from those sources and pays it to, artists, producers, uh, if they sign agreements, and labels. Uh, outside the U.S., um, royalties are paid to artists f by those traditional terrestrial AM, FM stations uh, for airplay, but in the U.S., that is not the case, and you know many already probably do know this, but the U.S. is really the only developed nation that does not pay artists or labels for airplay on terrestrial radio every other country does is a couple other kind of like um, developing nations that don't as well but the u.s is kind of an outlier when it comes to radio royalties that are paid for the radio uh in the u.s only songwriters and publishers get paid so music publishing royalties this one is complicated and it's complex and it's misunderstood uh and a lot of times it's hard to follow. And this is not just artists. I've talked to a lot of music industry professionals, managers, people that work at labels, um, you know, anybody dealing with an artist who's not in the publishing industry. A lot of times they have a hard time understanding music publishing royalties and they are complicated. Uh, but the best way to explain it, simplest way to explain it and to differentiate music publishing royalties from uh, sound recording royalties is to talk about cover songs. So I'm using the example of All Along the Watchtower, which I'm sure everybody knows. And, you know, you could argue that the more famous version of that song was recorded and released by Jimi Hendrix. But the song was originally recorded and released by Bob Dylan. Um, and Bob Dylan was the writer of that song. Jimi Hendrix did not write the song. So when it comes to publishing royalties that are paid for when this song is performed or when it's sold. Uh, only Bob Dylan and his music publisher earn music publishing royalties for the song. So it doesn't really matter who recorded it, Hendrix, Dylan, you know, you. Uh, the only person that would get paid on the publishing side for royalties is Bob Dylan because he's the songwriter. And yes, I know he sold his publishing rights, but you get the point. Um, so. 
music publishing has kind of two different, I guess you would call them streams uh, of royalties or types of royalties. Um, there's the performance royalties and then mechanical royalties. Performance royalties are uh, royalties that most people seem to understand uh, generally. Those are the royalties that if you're signed up with ASCAP or BMI or any other performing rights organization, um, referred to as PROs, those are the royalties you get from them. So if you're a songwriter and you're signed to ASCAP, when you get your statement, those are the performance royalties that you receive um, on, on the publishing side as the, as the writer of any songs that you have registered with them. Uh, mechanical royalties or mechanicals are the royalties that people sometimes have a hard time wrapping their head around. Uh, I think the main confusion comes from that a lot of people refer to mechanical royalties or mechanicals as the aforementioned artist, master, or record royalties. So they think when someone says mechanicals, they're talking about royalties payable to the artist for um, a sale of a song or you know a uh, stream of a song, and that is not the case. So mechanical royalties are only payable to songwriters and publishers, um, not to artists, uh, and definitely not to record labels. So mechanical royalties are payable when a song is produced as a recording and that recording is sold. Um, so music publishing royalties, again, get confusing because of the sort of difference between performance royalties and mechanical royalties. Um, like we said, you know, publishing royalties are only payable to people who wrote the song and the publishers or publishing administrators, you know, who collect that money. Uh, I'll talk about the difference between publisher and publishing administrator in a future video, but the short difference is that a publishing company typically owns the songs. A publishing administrator does not own the songs. They they basically just administer or you know collect royalties on behalf of the songwriter for a fee. Or percentage. Um, so a songwriter, you know, does not have to have a publisher, does not have to have a publishing administrator to receive publishing royalties. A songwriter can set up her own publisher or his own publisher through a formal company like an LLC or a corporation. Or, you know, in the case of like if you're if you are a writer with ASCAP, in order to collect all of your publishing royalties, you must have a publishing company entity. You have to have a name. So if I'm the writer, uh, you know, Seth Keller, uh, I could set up Seth Keller Music as a publishing company name in order to get that half of the uh, performance royalties. And we'll talk, I'll talk about, you know, the difference between songwriter uh, shares and publisher shares on performance in another video because that uh, further complicates publishing. Um, so performance royalties, those ASCAP, BMI royalties, are payable when songs are played or publicly performed on the radio or used in TV shows. Outside the U.S., they're also paid when a song uh, is in a film, and that film is... is um, publicly uh, shown at a theater or on a streaming service, something like that. Um, they are also theoretically payable when music is performed live at a concert or when recorded music is played at a concert venue or a bar, a coffee shop, a gym, a mall, uh, your dentist's office, you know, wherever you're going to hear music. Um, that's a performance, uh, royalties are theoretically payable to you as a writer when your song is performed in any of those settings. I say theoretically because, and again, I'll get into this down in another video, but, uh, all those places that you hear music when you're out in public are supposed to have licenses with the PROs. They're supposed to get a license from ASCAP and BMI and CSAC and whomever else, um, you know, the writers and publishers are signed with. But a lot of times small businesses do not, you know, have those licenses. So if your local hole in the wall bar is playing your song and they don't, they haven't signed up with ASCAP or BMI, then you wouldn't receive any royalties for that. Um, now it's not legal to do that, but a lot of, you know, small businesses either don't know or just don't 
want to pay or can't afford it, so they kind of try to get away with it. Uh, but again, that'll be for another video. Um, mechanical royalties are payable when a song is sold. So before streaming, this was pretty straightforward. You had a vinyl record, you had an 8-track, you had a cassette, a CD. That CD was sold, that vinyl was sold, um, and the writers of the songs that were on that record got paid mechanical royalties from the record label. And that royalty was a statutory rate. It was a rate set by a government entity called the Copyright Royalty Board. Again, more on that in future videos. But basically, everybody got the same amount. In the old days, it was nine cents per song. So if there was a CD that was released with 10 songs, uh, roughly 90 cents was set aside to pay all the writers and publishers of those 10 songs. Uh, that's the simple way to explain it. But things changed a lot when streaming came along. Uh, before we get into that, mechanical royalties. Why are they called mechanical royalties? Um, so the origin of this uh, dates back to the Tin Pan Alley days, if anyone's familiar with that, when there were player pianos and they had these rolls, as you see in the photo here, uh, with holes punched in them that represented musical notes. And so the uh, songs were basically mechanically reproduced in the form of these cylinders with the uh, paper um, that were played on the player piano. So that's why they called them mechanical royalties. So kind of weird, but that's where it comes from. Um, and it was all about the songs and the songwriters and the publishers had nothing to do with the artists. So, as I mentioned, streaming has complicated music publishing royalties quite a bit. Um, and so, when it comes to streaming, I'm referring to on-demand streaming, like Spotify, YouTube, Apple Music. And that basically means, on-demand streaming means that the listener can choose the song to stream. Um, since everything is basically the internet these days, radio stations, Pandora, Sirius XM, they stream music, obviously, but they're not considered on-demand streamers because listeners cannot choose what songs they hear on these streams. So you just have to listen to the stream. Some of them you can skip, you know, a certain number of songs, but that doesn't they still don't consider that um, on-demand streaming. On-demand streaming is if you're on Spotify or Apple Music or YouTube and you, you know, click on a playlist and play that or you find go search out for an artist and play a song or you create your own playlist it's on demand it's basically whatever you want when you want it um so on those on demand streaming platforms um from the music publishing side those streams are considered both a performance and a sale so basically as a writer and a publisher you get paid both a performance royalty and a mechanical royalty for streams that performance royalty is payable uh, to you from your PRO. So if you're signed with BMI, they're going to collect those Spotify performance royalties and they're going to pay you. The mechanical royalty portion is more complicated and it varies country to country. In the U.S., there is an organization called the Mechanical Licensing Collective that was formed several years ago and just started operating probably about eh, two years ago, formally. And if you are a writer, excuse me, if you're a publisher, you need to sign up with that. Now, that means if you're a writer who's self-published, you can sign up. You still can sign up. But they basically collect the mechanical royalties from stream, on-demand streams, but only from on-demand streams that are generated in the U.S. So basically... People with accounts who live or have accounts that are in the United States, the MLC, will collect those mechanical royalties from the Spotify's and Apple's and Amazon Music's of the world, uh, and then they will pay those out to the publishers of those songs. So if you're not signed up with the MLC as a writer or a publisher, you are missing out completely on those royalty streams. Uh, like I said, this is for the U.S. only. Um, and if you are not a U.S. writer or publisher, you can still sign up with the MLC, 
but the MLC does not collect any mechanical royalties for streams that are basically generated or uh, originate outside the U.S. So if somebody in Canada or Australia or South Africa streams a song on Spotify or any other on-demand service, uh, MLC is not collecting uh, mechanical royalties for those. Those are collected by the foreign countries. Um, performing rights organizations or um, collective management organizations. But in order to, if you're a U.S.-based writer or publisher, in order to get those royalties, you have to sign up with the publishing administrator. And that, all of that is for a future video. Um, but along with, you know, the, the writer and the uh, publisher getting paid for uh, on-demand streams, the artist and the, and the master owner do too. Uh, so that's, again, if you are signed to a label, the label's collecting those, you know, Spotify and Apple are paying the label or their distributor directly, and then the label's cutting you in on whatever percentage your deal says, if it's 20% or 50%, they pay you. Uh, if you are an independent artist and you're signed up with CD Baby or TuneCore, DistroKid, etc., those are the royalties they collect from the on-demand streamers, and they pay you every month, um. So that is it for this video. That is a lot. If you've kind of like understood it, uh, then pat yourself on the back. Um, you're way ahead of the game compared to your contemporaries. But I'm going to be, again, making some more videos and explaining a lot more about this topic. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any questions about what this video covered, if you have any questions about collecting royalties you're owed, or just questions about you know publishing or sound recording royalties in general, uh, reach out to me. Um, you know I'm happy to you know talk to you and answer questions. Uh, like I said, I also do consulting for artists. So if it's something you really need help going after as far as a collection, or you know you you have a project that you want someone involved with, I'm happy to talk to you about that as well. Um, but again, I'll answer any questions you want uh, for free. Uh, so hit me up. Um, hope you enjoyed the video. Hope it taught you something and uh, look out for subsequent videos in the coming weeks. Thanks.